All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to give everyone just a moment to get logged in and started. I want to welcome you because we have such a special webinar planned for you today. We have the great Peter Perlman who's with us, and we also have Eric and Doug who's going to be moderating throughout the webinar. You're going to hear all kinds of great stories and trial trips, and I am so excited to get started. Um, before we start, though, I do want to reach out and uh, just acknowledge and thank our amazing partners with HMR, Fast Funds, On Point, and Plane of Support. You guys are going to be able to meet several of them throughout the webinar, and um, we're going to have a great time. So I want to thank each of them for being a part of this. Um, I would like to go ahead and start by introducing, introducing our two moderators today. We have Doug Beam, who, as you know, is no stranger to the underdog. He's been a trial lawyer since 1985, and he has a reputation of being the lawyer's lawyer. He's been trying and winning the unwinnable. And with a passion for the courtroom, Doug has handled thousands of cases, and he's taken on hundreds to trial, and he scored some of the largest verdicts in Florida's history. He's also the past president of the Florida Council Bar Association presidents, and he's the very first recipient of the Brevard County Bar Association Professionalism Award, and he also serves on the executive committee of the National Trial Lawyers. Also during his free time, Doug loves spending time with his family, and he's very active in his church. And um, we also have Eric Romano, who, as you guys know, is the son of our beloved John Romano um, in the Romano Law Group in West Palm Beach. He is a Florida board certified criminal trial lawyer, as well as a partner at the Romano Law Group. And he's been effectively representing clients in civil and criminal matters, including personal injury and wrongful death, criminal defense and commercial litigation for over 15 years. And also during his career, Eric has gone to verdict in more than 100 criminal and trial cases. Um, he also began his legal career in 1997 as a prosecutor with the state attorney's office in Palm Beach County. And as an assistant state attorney, he prosecuted a wide variety of criminal cases that include misdemeanor, juvenile, domestic violence, and felony trial divisions. Um, before he ended up leaving in 2001 to start working with the Romano Law Group. Um, but one thing I'm very proud of Eric is he just recently served as the um, president of the Florida Justice Association. So Eric, congratulations on that wonderful year that you had. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you and Doug so we can get started. All right, well, thank you, Ginger, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to all of you for tuning in today. Uh, for those of you that are here with us, you are in for a real treat. It is such an honor and a privilege for me and Doug to be joined today by the great, the one and only Peter Perlman. So let me tell you a little bit about Pete, introduce him, uh, then I'll turn it over to Doug. And uh, look, we're, we're going to have a, uh, the equivalent of a fireside chat today with a true legend among legends. Uh, so Pete got his undergrad degree from Duke and then went on and got his law degree from the University of Kentucky. Uh, which leaves him very conflicted, I think, during basketball season. Um, but he hails from Lexington. Uh, he has had an incredibly accomplished and impressive legal career that spans nearly 60 years. And uh, we're going to tap into some of that experience and insight today, uh, learn a little bit from Pete. But Pete has served as a past president of the American Association for Justice, the Kentucky Academy of Trial Lawyers, the Civil Justice Foundation, Trial Lawyers for Public Justice. So you can see that his leadership and advocacy goes beyond the courtroom uh, and is giving back to the legal community in countless ways. Uh, he is also a proud member of the Inner Circle of Advocates, the International Academy of Trial Lawyers, the International Society of Barristers, and the list goes on. In the course of his career as a trial lawyer, he has achieved one verdict after another, and more than 80 of them have been multi-million dollar verdicts or recoveries for his clients. Uh, the Kentucky Justice Association names uh, one of its top honors after Pete. It is the Peter Perlman Outstanding Trial Lawyer of the Year Award. And in 2017, Pete was inducted into the National Trial Lawyer Hall of Fame, a very, very well-deserved honor. But of all of these great accomplishments, 
I can tell you, I've known Pete a long time, and there is no accomplishment he is prouder of uh, than his wife, Lana, their three kids, their four grandkids, and beyond his uh, great uh, career as a trial lawyer, he is widely known, widely regarded, and deeply proud of being first and foremost a top family man, husband, father, grandfather, and a great mentor. And uh, most of you on here, I'm sure, have heard Pete speak before. He has always been generous with his time, has been a great mentor and teacher, and continues to give back to all of us, helping the rest of us become better lawyers. So we are really pleased and uh, honored to be joined by Pete today. Uh, so Doug, I'm going to kick it over to you to uh, say a few words about Pete, and then we'll get going. Well, Peter, I, I, I don't mean to say this, hearing all the accolades about you and Eric, one thing I'm, I have to bring out, I, unlike both of you, I am also a uh, notary public. I wanted to mention that. Uh, you know, I, just, I think I knew that. I think that's important. But we've asked a, a number of people for questions, uh, Peter, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I have to say on a personal level, you have helped my clients, You've helped my family and you've helped me through your lectures over the years. As a new lawyer, I, uh, I went to every lecture I could that you gave and I ordered recordings of your lectures. That's what a positive influence you've been on me. But I'd like to know, I understand, just to give some context here of how you become a Hall of Famer and all that. Did you, I understand you were a multi-sport high school athlete playing uh, a number of sports and then wound up playing some college ball. Can you help us a, a little bit with that? Tell us about how you grew up, why you like sports, how you wound up going to the university, all of that. Can you give me a little bit about that and maybe how that translated into you being a trial lawyer? Okay. Uh Try to cover. That's a lot of a lot of ground there to cover, Doug. But first, I want to thank you, Doug, for uh, being such a great lawyer, being such a great friend, and being involved in this program today. And I want to thank Eric and both of you. I admire you greatly, and and I can't thank you enough for for what you're doing. Thank you. uh, first, I want to clear up a little uh, mention that uh, Eric made. He said I graduated from Duke Law School. I did not, he, I think he said I graduated from Duke University and went to UK Law School. What actually happened was I graduated from the University of Kentucky. Uh, I was a uh, pre-med major in college. Hmm. And uh, then University of Kentucky didn't have a medical school and I was actually admitted to Duke University to medical school. Um, and as luck would have it, I had to make a 3.5 average to keep that. And only four students in the class made that and I did not. So I transferred back to the University of Kentucky, back to law school. Uh, I worked over in Chapel Hill and Durham, Ten and Bar and, and waiting on tables and sorority houses. And then back at UK, uh, I finished law school. Going back before that, uh, my mom and dad owned a five and 10 cent store in a little town called South Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. There is, no, there is no North Fort Mitchell, but it was kind of the end of the streetcar line. So I had a brother that was brilliant and uh, he got many scholarships. I got no scholarship offers to go to college. So I thought, well, I'll try it in sports. Uh, my eighth grade teacher sent a note home and said, uh, uh, Peter is a, a nice child, but he's not a college prospect. He doesn't have the attention span that's gonna be needed for him to succeed in college. So somehow my parents let me know about that. And I decided, well, I'll try sports. Uh, my football coach said, Pete, the trouble with you is you're small, but you're slow. Uh, so my athletic achievements were, were very limited. Uh, I did wind up at the University of Kentucky, uh, no scholarship. I served meals in the football house. Uh, I drove a car for AAA, taught driver's training. Uh, I became a bartender and I advanced from the football house to the sorority houses and started serving meals there 
as a senior. So that's kind of my, uh, my initial background. Uh, when I was in uh, law school, I'll go on to law school. Is that okay? Yeah, oh, this is fabulous. Yeah. So I went on to law school. And uh, one day on the street, I ran into a fellow named Tommy Bell. Now, those of you that follow football will remember that Tommy Bell was an NFL football referee. And one year he did the Super Bowl and the NCAA championship, both in one year as, as a referee. So he was big time. But when I first met him, I was playing high school basketball and he was the referee. He wasn't famous then, but he was kind of doing high school refereeing and starting into colleges. And he called a foul on me in a tournament game. And uh, I didn't think I deserved the foul. The ball was near my foot and I gave it a little gentle kick. And he said, you're out of the game, number seven. And I said, I'm out anyway, that's my fifth foul, which, which was true. <laughs> So now fast forward about eight years and I'm a senior in law school and I'm teaching driver training. So I went downtown and, and to pick up my car. His mother worked at a department store in downtown Lex. So I ran into him and I, I recognized him. He didn't initially recognize me, but I said, hey, Mr. Bell, how you doing? He said, I'm doing good. How you doing? I said, I'm OK. And I said, are you still I see you're still officiating? So, yeah, you still drop kicking basketballs. So. That led to a friendship. Uh, we had lunch that day. And uh, over, over the next month or so, uh, we got together. He offered me a job. And I went with his law firm right out of law school. So that was the beginning of my legal career. I have a follow-up here before I toss it back to you. My number seven, was that your preferred number? Yes, it was. OK. I think every athlete I know has a number and there's a reason for it. So uh, was that because that's a lucky seven or you just got somebody pitched you a jersey and had a seven on it? Actually, the somebody else had a seven and he got injured and he couldn't play and that was about the only number that was left. <laughs> but from then on, I, I took number seven. One other thing I have to I, add. I was not a great athlete. That's a tough thing to start out on. I was, like the coach said, a small but slow. And, uh, but I had a tough time. I enjoyed doing it. As we're getting into the major league playoffs, uh, you know, I look at the pitchers. They use a whole lot of pitchers now in a baseball game, Peter. Could you hit an outside pitch? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> uh, I could hit the inside pitch, but the trouble was all our games were outside. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you, Eric. <laughs> um, well, Pete, um, you know, following up on the, the background you just gave us and growing up and kind of your, your education, what led you to choose law school and pursue a career as a trial lawyer? I know you started off at one point in pre-med thinking maybe you were going to head uh, the direction of a career in medicine. But what, well, what the pre-med pre uh, was great great background and when I started practicing law I sort of had a, had an edge there because I knew a little bit of medicine but uh, ultimately I got a scholarship to law school I did not have one to medical school and uh, I got to southern regional scholarship which gave southern east and western and northern and I started at Duke and uh, I had to make uh, gr certain grades to keep the scholarship and I did not I did well, but I had I didn't have any money, so I went back to the University of Kentucky, finished college, law school. Now that, that answer the question? It did, yes, sir. Okay. Now, uh, Eric, if I may, um, are you the first lawyer? Are you the first lawyer in your family, Peter? I know you said your parents ran a five and dime. Are you the first lawyer in your family? No, my brother, like I said, was very smart and he, he did well. He, uh, he got scholarships to several colleges. He became a writer, unfortunately he passed away. And, but I'm the only, uh, yes, only, only lawyer in the family. Eric, you just finished a year as president of the Florida Justice Association. You think you could talk to Peter a little bit about voluntary bar associations and, and if they're important or not? 
Uh, yeah, well, look, you know from the introduction that Peter has done an awful lot of that uh, in his career. So, Peter, I know you have uh, led us as a trial bar, uh, not only at the state level in Kentucky, but at the national level through AAJ and others. Um, you talk to us a little bit about why you did that. I know that, that that's a sacrifice, not only personally, but professionally. Why was that important to you? And do you think that's important for uh, your fellow lawyers to get involved in professional uh, activities like that? Absolutely. And I know both of you have been very active. And, and again, I want to congratulate you, Eric, on being the president of the uh, Florida Justice Association. Great job that you've done. But initially, if you wanted to learn how to try a case, uh, you would attend seminars. And uh, ADLA used to have seminars and uh, state organizations used to have seminars. And you kind of got to know people. And eventually uh, I became fairly active and uh, I wasn't real pleased with the way that, that some of the uh, AAJ uh, activities were going. I didn't really feel like that there was enough opportunity for education and, and uh, there weren't many women involved and there weren't any minorities involved. And uh, I was kind of a long shot really to ever become president. Uh, but just by being fairly active and I got elected parliamentarian and, and then uh, got elected president, Scotty Baldwin, a great lawyer from Texas, and I were we're sort of the rabble rousers and we kind of ran against the establishment and uh, we had a great time, but I think we made a big difference in, in the organization until uh, I became president and, and including Scott of the year before, consumer groups were not a big factor. It was, uh, Adela had a lobbyist and, and uh, consumer groups were really uh, considered to sometimes be in the way. And uh, I felt very strongly that uh, you had to be associated with people's injuries to know how to communicate their injuries and to attend uh, Congress and to testify and things of that nature. And we, we started doing a lot of that and we formed consumer coalitions. We even helped Bill Colson, a great lawyer from uh, Miami, uh, got me down to Florida and, and I appeared in the legislature that, that year. And uh, I think you all were dealing with Title IX, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Uh, there was a big push in Florida to change your laws and it included dealer. I mean, uh, the injured people would have to pay if they lost, loser pays and things of that nature. And I came down and testified in the legislature and, uh, and uh, AAJ, which was called ATLA then, uh, we had uh, limited opportunities, like I said, for uh, women and uh, minorities, and uh, we opened it up and uh, we made a big pitch for membership. We went like from 30,000 members to 72,000 members in that one year, and uh, everybody loved it. And we had great seminars, great speakers and great educational programs. And we had a big fight in the uh, United States uh, Senate and Congress. Uh, uh, trying to overcome uh, draconian uh, law reforms. And one thing that came up this summer, I went to the past president's uh, meeting in Las Vegas. And at the meeting, uh, Rich Haley, who's, who's a black lawyer from uh, Indiana, and Roxanne Conlon from Iowa, uh, they both uh, said at the meeting that, uh, that they got involved in AAJ the year I was president through our efforts and through our encouragement. And that literally opened the door for many other minorities and, and women that have become active and very much involved to this day. So I'm really proud of that. Uh, as far as young people goes, uh, you got to be active in your state association. You can't be active enough as far as I'm concerned uh, because people give their time to speak, to help, to uh, provide uh, insights, to provide tra trial transcripts. And I, I can't find any other way that would be better for a young lawyer than to do that. I'm a little long with my answers, but I'm trying to cover a lot of ground here. 
No, that's good. We we want to hear from you. Uh, you got so much uh, experience to share with all of us. And uh, speaking of experience, I know anytime we get to spend time with a uh, a courtroom lawyer who has had one battle after another, it's always uh, always fun and um, educational to hear some war stories. So, Doug, may, maybe you can uh, have Pete talk to us a little bit about some of the war stories and some of the uh, the, the great trials and tribulations in the courtroom. Well, Peter, uh, I noticed uh, some of the uh, viewers, uh, Justin Kahn, a great trial lawyer, practices with his father, who's 89 years old. I know Justin. You know Justin, his dad? Absolutely. Good, good lawyer, great lawyer, publishes the two leading treatises on civil procedure and evidence in South Carolina. He's writing in. Uh, Glenda Green said, go cats. And Rand Randy Kynard said, Number seven, that's because Perlman has a zillion seven-figure verdicts and settlements. <laughs> so maybe there's a reason. They, that was foreshadowing. P Peter, can you tell me, you were inspirational to me. You're a very kind man. Uh, uh, when I would go hear you, I went up and introduced myself. You were a gentleman uh, to, to talk with. I noticed one thing. I heard you at National Trial Lawyers, Pete, Peter, and you had something that looked like this like something you get at a dry cleaner. I modified it. I designed my own writing pads called the Discovery Notepad. Okay, I okay. Modified it. It's called the Pearl. And if anyone Great. watching this drops me a line, I'll send you a few of these. This right. I had made because this is how you did your closing and maybe your opening. Can you tell how the world did you come up with such a brilliant idea given the way you can write things you get why why did how did you come up with that you see this yes see these are my notes this is a shirt back i get my shirts folded and uh they they put these in the shirts and uh and i was in a trial early on in my career uh rather than having a legal pad where you have to fold the pages back and and it's yellow and everybody has one i kind of had all of my notes on one sheet and i could walk around the courtroom and and it wasn't as distractive and and uh, you know sometimes we rely on notes a little bit too much so i kind of liked it and i i was using the shirt back one time and and then uh one of the jurors after the trial was over he said uh, you know i'm in the printing business and i'd be glad to give you a lot of these so that you won't have to get a shirt cleaned every time you need one. So <laughs> his name was Herbie Feedback and he had feedback printing and he must have given me 500 shirt backs and and I've used them ever since. And, you know, it's been invaluable to me, but I, I'm glad you remember that. You came from a small town. Do you have to come? There's a book written by Russell Conwell many years ago, and he gave a speech. It's a book based on a speech he gave over 10,000 times uh, called Acres of Diamonds. He was uh, used the money to found Temple University. And his one of the themes in that book, y'all may have read it, whatever, but was you don't have to leave the area you grow up in. You can be successful and make a positive difference. Do you think some of the attendees today and who may look at this recording, can you offer any advice on that? Do you have to be from New York City or Miami or Los Angeles or Chicago to be a great trial lawyer, Peter? Well, I don't think so. Uh, many, many lessons or many uh, uh, lifetime traits, I think, that, that uh, I try to use, have used throughout my life have been based on my experience and, and where I grew up. My uh, dad had a five and 10 cent store. He, he had no employees except my mother and uh, she would come and help out. And uh, during Christmas holidays and when I was in school, I would come in and help out. And uh, we had, you know, today you have uh, Walmart and Pro and Press and all the, you know, uh, big box stores and, and all of that. Well, we didn't have any of that. We didn't even have charge accounts, but families would come in and every time that anybody had a, had a child, my mom and dad would give them something for coming in. They were very, very generous. 
and uh, they would have layaways for Christmas. So instead of having charge accounts where you pay monthly, the people didn't have to pay until Christmas time. So they had uh, packages that, that would hold for, uh, that would, we would hold for them until Christmas. And if they didn't come in and pay for their packages, it was all their toys for their kids, for the you know gifts for the entire family. So it'd be my job to deliver these layaways to these people's homes. And my dad would say, well, we're going to clear the inventory, which meant he wasn't going to charge for the layaway. Right. And I would, it'd be my job to deliver these to these families. And when I told them that there wasn't going to be any charge, uh, the mom, the, the parents, I mean, they would almost cry how excited they were. And they, at first they thought they weren't going to get anything because they didn't pay for their layaways. And to see the joy in the, in the uh, eyes of the kids, for these presents that all of a sudden appeared. I mean, uh, I can't think of, to me, uh, every time I have a case, I try to find a way to, to, to make life better for the people involved. And uh, my, my dad said uh, that the only thing he needed to concentrate on, he didn't say anything about the money or the inventory. He said, make every customer feel better for this experience so i've tried to do that uh and i i would urge if there's one trait that uh a young lawyer uh could could use throughout their life it would be that one all right well erica one of our uh, uh attendees wants to ask what was your first case peter do you remember it yeah it was a long ago but i do remember it <laughs> Uh, we had a case. Uh, when I first got out of law school, I joined the law firm. I told you about Tommy Bell, the uh, referee, and he was also an outstanding lawyer and, and a lifelong friend. So I joined the law firm right out of law school. And within several months, uh, a painter came in. He was, he was a painter for one of the lawyer's homes. His name was Harlan Doolin. The case is in the law books. So Harlan came in and, and he was telling Tom Collins, the, the lawyer, about what happened to him. He was supposed to be painting for Tom Collins and he couldn't make it that day. He said, uh, why didn't you come in? And he said, well, it was raining and I was sitting in the zebra bar, which was kind of a downtown saloon. I was sitting in the bar with a friend and a bus turned the corner too sharp and hit the corner of the bar and he pinned Harlan between the bar <laughs> and the corner of the building. Wow. So it wasn't a, wasn't a serious injury, but he went to the doctor anyway and they checked him out and he had some bruises and, and he missed two days of work. So Harlan said to Mr. Collins, he said, uh, you think you could get me in those days, there wasn't an insurance for everybody and, and they didn't cover your wages said, you think you could get me my money for losing my pay that day and for losing those two days of work? And so being a new lawyer, Tom Collins said, Pete, can you take care of Harlan? So I contact the Lexington Transit Company and, and they said, well, you have to call our headquarters in Atlanta. I, they didn't answer my calls. They didn't answer my letter. So I said to Harlan, I said, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I can't do any good for you, Harlan. And so we were sitting there one day with Tom and he said, why don't you go ahead and sue, sue the Lexington Transit Company? I mean, his medical expenses were like $350 and two, two days lost wages then wasn't very much. I said, okay. So I sued Lexington Transit Company. They answered the, uh, the lawsuit. Uh, they didn't even take depositions. They didn't really want to know anything. They wouldn't offer anything before we went. So we just went to trial. So we're in trial and, and a young lawyer's uh, there on behalf of uh, Lexington Transit Company and Harlan Doolin is testifying and he told a story the way I told it and he's being cross-examined and the lawyer wanted to, you know, make a big deal out of this thing. And he said, now, Mr. Doolin, it's my understanding that you were in the zebra bar on this day on a Wednesday afternoon. He said, yes, sir. And you were drinking beer at that time, were you not? said, yes, I was. And where was your wife? She was at home and you had small children. They were at home too. 
And with your wife taking care of your small children, you sitting in the bar on a Wednesday afternoon drinking beer, how do you justify that audacious conduct? And Harlan Doolin, who'd had a fourth grade education, he kind of rolled his eyes and said, I don't know about that audacious stuff, but I sure wasn't expecting a bus to run into him. <laughs> True story. So the jury gave a, you know, a fairly substantial verdict at that time uh, for pain and suffering. We weren't asking for much. We we're only asking like for $5,000 for pain and suffering. And they gave that and they gave some for lost wages, and medical expenses. Well, after the case over, I thought that they pay. They didn't offer a nickel again. They said, well, we're gonna take this up to the Court of Appeals. And, and that, in those days, we only had a Court of Appeals and interim, we didn't have a Supreme Court. So the Court of Appeals affirmed the verdict, said it was generous, but it was not excessive. And that kind of became in 1966, that kind of became a uh, showcase for uh, juries deciding verdicts rather than a judge deciding them. So I kind of got a little reputation on that one. And that was my first case. All right, Eric, what do you have to say right. following up that? That's, that's an incredible story. Well, look, I know that that was the first of uh, many, many uh, trials and, and verdicts. So, uh, you know, you've got uh, an audience full of trial lawyers today that have tuned in to learn from one of the best. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you prepare for trial and what advice you would give your fellow lawyers uh, getting ready to go do battle in the courtroom? I sure try, but I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, there's a, probably a lot of great lawyers in the audience. And uh, sometimes I'm, I'm a little, little uneasy about telling great lawyers how they should practice, but I'll, I'll give a little insight into my preparation. Uh, I like to, you know, I like to think that we have two advantages. One, we represent the underdog. And two, we get to go first. And I think those are, you know, we get to do the opening statement and we get to uh, uh, do the voir dire first. And, you know, we have those advantages. Um, I like to, if I'm trying a case out of state or out of town, I always like to go to the place well in advance of the trial day. You've always got hearings. You've always got reasons to be there. Uh, I'll give an example rather than just uh, generalities, but we had a case in a place called Inez, Kentucky, a uh, small town. Uh, it's in the mountains and uh, it's hard to get to, hard to get back from. And uh, I had a, a pretty significant case there against a coal mine and international harvester. So we'd have hearings there. The defense lawyer was the president of the state bar on behalf of international harvesters. So they, they were spending a boatload of money and we would go down to Inez maybe once a month there for a couple of years for a uh, hearing motion day. And Inez didn't have a movie, didn't have a theater. So the theater was actually coming to court day for those motion days and it'd be full of people uh, coming in to see the lawyers and, and hearing the arguments. And by the time we got to trial, uh, I had met people every time I went down, like I would get a prescription filled. I would go to the cleaners. Sometimes I would get a haircut. One time my car broke down. I had an old Mercedes diesel and it was cold and the diesel uh, quit. And I had to spend like a weekend there in the uh, uh, apartment above the mechanic's garage. And so before you know it, I knew a lot of people in the town of Inez. So we get to trial date. And we're picking a jury and, and uh, the judge asks how many people know the uh, local lawyer, how many people knew me and how many people knew the other lawyers. And when they got to me, about 12 hands went up out of about 25 people. And the lawyer for the uh, International Harvest, he said, judge, I've got to approach the bench. He said, approach the bench. Judge, I don't know how this guy from Lexington, Kentucky now, there's 12 people in Inez, deep in the mountains, when the local lawyer for the coal company only knew two of them. So the judge says, how do you explain it? Uh, 
and I knew the judge. He was he was nice and he was very gracious. And, and I said, "Well, judge, I met this I met this gentleman who runs the drugstore. I met this gentleman who I stayed in his garage, and several of the people I met through several restaurants around town. So uh, that's a great advantage. You're no longer a stranger, and uh, uh, that's one." thing that I think is great about uh, preparation, but you got to know your environment and uh, you got to do it early. Well, uh, Peter, the uh, you mentioned Inez. That, that sounds like a good name or a good name to have in a country song, country music. <laughs> Do you, I, I'm just trying to, I, I had a relative, uh, Aunt Inez, beautiful lady. Can we take anything away from country music that would help us as trial lawyers? We also have oh. other genres, hip hop, rap, uh, opera. We have, uh, but country music seems to bring stories that resonate with people. Do you oh, have absolutely. a theory? You have a theory on country music versus the other genres? I use a lot of country music and I have in, in many trials. Uh, there's great songs. I, she was a, she was only a moonshiner's daughter, but I loved her still. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who is hey, that? Uh, hey, Peter, hang on. I want to pick up on that theme, but I think, Ginger, we have someone popping in here, but hold that okay. thought, Peter. We'll be right back with you. I uh, will. Is that Bruce Braxton on Fast Funds there? Yes, it is. Good afternoon. Hey, what do you Hello, think Bruce. about Peter Perlman so far? You think he's going to, what do you think? I think we have, this This is an opportunity to sit and listen to one of the great trial lawyers of our time. I'm, I'm sitting here listening to some great stories and and appreciative in the ability to do so. How's your day going? Everything good with you? Uh, uh, I have a daytime job, no heavy lifting. It's very good. Bruce, why don't you tell us about Fast Funds? Well, our company is a uh, uh, provides solutions that are non-recourse in nature for plaintiff attorneys to help you move your cases forward a little bit faster. And uh, to quote Mr. Perlman, um, with our plaintiff support um, programs such as our uh, pre-settlement funding make life a little bit better for your clients while you're working on their claim. Um, this type of financing or this type of, uh, of funding isn't for every client, but there comes a time at which it becomes necessary to help your clients get to the point in which you need them. And our money can sometimes help make life better um, for your clients during the time that you're working on their cases. Uh, we offer programs that are pre-settlement and post-settlement for, for plaintiffs. We also have programs for plaintiff attorneys to offset the costs of your, your expert witnesses and, and uh, provide you a little bit more time, a little bit more money to make your, your, your efforts and get the best results for your clients possible. How long have you been doing that? You and your dad, your dad was the George Washington of uh, funding, wasn't he? How long has your dad, have your dad and you been doing this? Uh, my father started our, in, our, our business back in the mid nineties. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to come and join him in the, in 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. Uh, we are a family business. My younger brother, Jason holds down the fort when I am on the road um attending seminars and 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 participating actively as a vendor in trial or associations and and that was something that mr perlman also said something about earlier and that's where you you learn um as a as a, a funding company i spend a lot of time in 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 your association meetings and it teaches me um the, a lot and it gives me an advantage over those that that don't spend time listening to the seminars and they don't have the opportunity to hear speakers on topics 
ranging from motor vehicle accidents to slip and falls to how you do your voir dire, how it's a, you can learn so much in a trial lawyers association. We're very proud to sponsor several of them in the state, Florida, Georgia, Southern trial lawyers, national trial lawyers. Um, it's a big part of what we do. And uh, connectionology, again, is another way that you spread education and have an opportunity to, to learn a little bit more. Thanks, Bruce. And Eric, do you ever use tri uh, nurse consultants? We have Diane Brown here from, where are you reporting in from? The Keystone State up in yes, Pennsylvania, sir. Diane? Yes, sir. What do you think, Eric? What do you think of nurse consultants? Are they value added? Oh, they're, they're vital. So Diane, thank you to you and on point for uh, supporting this and being on with us today. But I know, uh, and, and Bruce to you, thank you as well. I know fast funds have been a big supporter of connectionology and a lot of the work we do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look in this day and age, um, the, the expertise that nurse consultants bring to a case is absolutely vital. Um, because they often find things that, that us mere lawyers often miss, uh, because, <laughs> I, I tell you, I've often said uh, they should teach handwriting in uh, medical school. And I know uh, it's gotten a lot different now with electronic medical records uh, making a lot of it easier, but you all can make a lot better sense of that than we can. So Diane, uh, turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit about what you and On Point do. All right, let me just do this. <laughs> well, it... It's really been exciting listening to all the wisdom, uh, Mr. Perlman, that you're imparting on not only the vendors, because I totally agree with Bruce, you guys tell us what you need. You tell us what trends are happening, what you need to save you and your plaintiff's time. And it is really a pleasure listening to you. And I've, uh, I've really been enjoying it. But On Point Legal Nurse Consulting actually has been working with the Romano Group and um, Doug's Group for a while now. For the past 25 years, we've been supporting attorneys on any case that has a medical component. And to Eric's point, we hear from attorneys all the time. I review my own bread and butter cases. I, you know, I know what I'm looking for. Um, and I totally agree with you. If you guys have been doing it for 30 years, you know exactly what to look okay. for. Okay. <laughs> but I think sometimes you might not know what's missing. And I think that's some of the things, some of the expertise and the clinical insight that nurses can bring to your review of your medical record. Uh, we just came back from um, ATAA and we talked to attorneys and they are really overwhelmed. They're looking for somebody to serve as a backup because they're juggling multiple cases post COVID or they just need some help, help <clears throat> excuse me, help with the review of a medical record um, because it's a little bit more complex than what they're used to. Whether we're doing a timeline, a chronology, or a case analysis, we are going to make sure that you are never blindsided by anything that's in that medical record. Whether it's a missing record, um, impact of pre-existing conditions you know can really um, affect the outcome of your case, strengths and weaknesses, red flags, potential defendants, all of those things can really be helpful. Um, and to have that nursing insight, I think, is key. If you're not used to legal nurse consulting or you're new um, to this type of support, we can really help streamline your trial prep. We can save valuable staff time. If you're looking for an expert, you need some fresh talent, we can locate and vet clinically active experts for you. Um, maybe you need a life care plan or a pain and suffering report because you're heading to the settlement table. Um, they can be very impactful and of course, for some of the attorneys will call and say, hey, can we just call and discuss a case with you real quick? Absolutely. Our, our program coordinators will do a phone consultation with you to see how we can support you at no cost. So if we can help you in any way, um, make your life easier, save you some time, free up your staff so they can concentrate on maybe the legal aspects of your case, give us a call. We'd be happy to help. Exactly. Thank, thanks, Diane. I see Neil O'Donnell from your neighborhood up there in Pennsylvania is watching today. A uh, great trial lawyer from uh, the state of Pennsylvania. So thank you and Bruce. All right. Now thank you gonna, so much. We're going to pick up where we left off. Peter, we have a question someone wrote in. Uh, well, let's come back to that question in just a moment. You said, I mentioned country music. 
And you mentioned something about moonshine. I went to undergraduate school at Western Carolina University in the mountains, and uh, people from our dorm could leave a five on a, a tree stump, come back, and there'd be some moonshine. But they knew where that came from because they didn't want to go sterile or blind from what they were drinking, consuming, even though I, I'm here with the space background. But I think that stuff was rocket fuel for what my uh, the people who bought it said. You mentioned a lyric regarding moonshine and you were talking about country music and maybe how that can help the trial lawyer. Yeah, I was just throwing that one out in jest. It was, she was only a moonshiner's daughter, but I loved her still. Uh, that's, that's kind of a, uh, one that's just in a good, good humor, but I do use a lot of music and I've used a lot of country music. Um, I use, uh, the Kenny Chesney song, this is our moment. Uh, which you can use, you, can, you know, as, as far as your imagination will take you. Uh, you can use that as a theme. And there's great songwriters, and and they can write something and uh, and have it uh, played and recorded uh, that kind of captures a whole case in a nutshell a whole lot better than I would in talking for 15 or 20 minutes. This is our moment. Uh, I had a case uh, in which we had a claim for loss of consortium. And uh, this was a couple that had been married like for 50 years and they'd had ups and downs. And the defense lawyer was claiming that uh, how much, you know, they'd been separated and they'd had all these problems and, and how could she claim really damages for loss of consortium. And uh, just in driving my, just in driving one day, I heard the song and I thought, here it is, Through the Years by Kenny Rogers. And, uh, you know, we could take the whole life and the ups and downs and, and say through the years, you know, you've always been around and, and that, that really helped a lot. Uh, that's two examples. Uh, I've used George Jones uh, choices, choices from the day I was born, choices to tell me right from wrong. And uh, you could use that in any case. And I've used it in some of the biggest cases I've ever had. Uh, I like the Gladys Knight. That's not necessarily a country song, but uh, if they could ever write my life story and uh, you could take uh, just about any case, especially a wrongful death case, and uh, you could weave that in. So these are just some examples, but I love music. I love country music. And uh, I think it's great uh, because another thing is I like everyday life experiences and and uh, people connect with songs and music. It becomes part of their lives. All right, Eric, back to you. All right. Well, uh, Pete, one of our uh, attendees has asked, can you tell us a little bit about the railroad crossing case you had involving the blocked view? They must have heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> who, who is this that asked? This was, uh, let me see here. Ronald, Ron Luke. Ronald Luke's. Ronald okay. Luke. Uh, Ron, this was a case in, uh, this was actually, I told you about the Harlan Doolin case. This was my second case. And it was, it was way back in the, uh, like 1967 and 1968. Uh, and in those days, uh, the railroad law was you had to stop, look, and listen at a, at a railroad crossing. And in Kentucky, we had contributory negligence, which was a total bar. So if you didn't stop, look, and listen, then you were totally out of luck. So I was with this law firm that I mentioned earlier, and a former judge on, on the uh, Supreme Court of Tennessee had referred this case to a judge in my law firm. And he said, would you go over to uh, Winchester and try this case? And it happened in Mount Vernon, Kentucky. The defense lawyers were three former state presidents of the state bar. And, and it was me on the other side. And I went down to the crossing. And if you look to your left, you could see down the railroad tracks. If you went to, wanted to look to your right, there was a big poster, uh, almost as wide as, a, as the side of a barn, 
which said see Rock City from atop Lookout Mountain. And you couldn't see down the tracks past like 50 or 75 yards. So uh, this, this fella, uh, Bill Shoemaker, he had testified. Some lawyers got in it before me and had given his deposition. And they said, did you look to your right? Did you look to your left? He said, yes, I did. He said, was there anything coming? No, there wasn't. Did you look to your right? He said, no, it wouldn't make any sense to look to your right. I've been up that road many times and you can't see if you look to your right. So he said, no, I didn't look. He maybe should have said, well, I don't remember, but he said, I didn't look. So now I'm going to trial and I got a client who says he didn't look. And there, there you go with the stop, look and listen law. So we put on the case and, and the witnesses said, you cannot look, you can't see anything down that railroad crossing. The judge says, well, I'm gonna let the case go to the jury. So the case goes to the jury and uh, the jury rules in our favor, but only to the extent of giving him his medical expenses and damage to his truck. So, you know, he'd admitted he didn't look, so he was negligent and they had to answer that interrogatory. So they didn't give anything for pain and suffering. So these three former state bar presidents went to the bench and said, judge, you have to give pain and suffering if you give anything for medical expenses. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of new. I, and I say, yeah, I think that's right, judge. So the judge says, well, I'm going to instruct the jury to go back and, and retire again and, and to correct the verdict. So it's obviously it's a compromised verdict that they wanted to give him something, but they didn't want to give him a whole lot. So they went back and they came back in and said, uh, judge, we can't make up our mind. This happened three times. Now the lead defense lawyer said, judge, I, I move you instruct the juror foreman to put in a dollar for pain and suffering so we could all go home. And the judge says, well, I'm just gonna ask him if they need to retire again. So the, the foreman says, judge, I think we can do it right here in the box. So they're sitting in the box and talking to each other. And within like two minutes, they come back with a $10,000 verdict for pain and suffering. Judge says, all right, he, dis he dismisses the jury. They appeal it to the court of appeals again. Uh, no, I'm sorry. There's, uh, the judge enters a judgment notwithstanding the verdict because of the admitted comparative contributory negligence. So now I'm the appellant. I'm now the appealing lawyer and we go to the court of appeals and we win and it's a classic opinion uh, where the justice, Justice Palmore wrote this opinion, said there is no reason that they should have to buy, abide by this longstanding precedent. If you can't see, if you look down the crossing and in effect, they abolish the stop, look and listen law in that case. And, you know, early on in my career, uh, then I got invited to speak to the Tennessee trial lawyers on railroad law. I mean, I tried one case, suddenly I'm this nationally known railroad lawyer. And uh, so that was, that was what that case was about. And the second part of the story is that there was a passenger in the truck who was hurt very badly. The driver was not hurt very bad. The passengers hurt very badly. And <laughs> the uh, the lawyer for the, the judge that referred to the case was going to try the case of the passenger. So I went down to help him get, get the uh, witnesses ready. And he said, why don't you go ahead and try it? Since you know all about the witnesses and all that. So I tried it. We got a huge verdict in Tennessee in 1968, I guess. And I, that's when they invited me to speak. So it was a significant case in my career. And, uh, uh, I've kept up with, with uh, these cases and the people for the most part have become lifelong friends. Uh, Sorry Eric, about my dog. She's uh, kind of getting a little, uh, little crazy on me. Well, that's all right, Peter. We have a blue tick town named Smokey at the University of Tennessee. We like dogs. I have, I have okay. a question. <laughs> Howard Rosenfeld, and by the way, I see Helen Kim, uh, Kim just saw her or Helen Lim, by the way, uh, from California. She's joined us. Uh, but Howard, Rose, Howard Rosenfeld had said, Peter, can you talk about the time the dean of the defense bar called you, quote, a model trial lawyer? End quote. <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, this was the same lawyer that uh, tried the International Harvester case 
in Inez, Kentucky. Uh, and he then presided over the state bar meeting several months later. And we've been through this, uh, this trial and, you know, we had our arguments and, and tussles back and forth. And, and uh, I received an award from the state bar. So he had to give the awards. And he said, and now the, the uh, safety award is, is going to be presented to Peter Perone. All I can tell you about him is he's a model trial lawyer. So after all we've been through, I thought, man, that's really classic. So I said, uh, afterwards, I went up and I said, Charlie, that was really nice of you to say that. And he said, well, you know what I mean by that? And I said, well, tell me what you mean. He said, you're a miniature replica of the real thing. <laughs> True story. Well, that's, that's great stuff. Uh, and I mentioned Helen Lim of California. We have people from all over the place that's great. These questions in here. What's this? Someone wanted to know you've given a lot of talks. What's the smallest number of people you've talked to and what's the largest number? And then I'm giving it back to Eric. Okay. Uh, smallest number. I went to uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. And uh, I got out there when the weather was good. I flew through Chicago and through Denver and got to Rapid City and they were having a meeting and and I checked into the hotel and and uh, the next day was going to be the luncheon and I was going to be the luncheon speaker and uh, <clears throat> they had bad weather uh, the roads were bad and and the people couldn't get there so there was uh, one speaker before me and. And he was, he was speaking and, and then it was my turn. So the moderator introduced me and there was only one person in the audience left. There were a few there before then, but only one person left because of the bad weather. So he introduced me and then uh, I gave my little speech and there were like three people there, the moderator and the previous people and the guy in the audience. So I thanked the guy in the audience for hanging around. He said, uh, well, you don't have to thank me, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> Uh, the largest, uh, I'm, I'm guessing it was probably the Hall of Fame induction out in uh, Las Vegas. I mean, uh, that was that was incredible. And Eric, I'm sure uh, you were there, but I would guess there were like 500 people there for that. At least, yeah, big crowd. Uh well, you know, you talked about a lot of the cases you've handled, and I know there's plenty of others that you've not talked about, but, you know, as you look back over your career, Pete, is, is there any one case that stands out to you as uh, maybe one that you're most proud of or that has had the most profound impact either on you or on uh, the, the law? Yeah, yeah. Uh... The cases that I've been fortunate enough to be involved in, have, um, some of them have actually changed the law. Like I said, the railroad crossing case, the, I've had cases uh, in uh, South Carolina of uh, seat back failures at uh, rear seat seat belts. And uh, we were gonna take Lee Iacocca's deposition and that was heavily fought out. And, and uh, we finally settled the case on the way to the airport. A lawyer named Kendall Few and I were involved in that case, and then they changed the law, and then we had a case involving a, uh, all kinds of products and defects. But uh, two, I'll mention two, Eric, if it's okay, that uh, probably uh, have made more of an impact on me and maybe on the law. But uh, one was we had an airplane crash case here in Lexington, uh, 2010. 49 people were killed in the crash. Uh, there was a Kime Air flight heading from Lexington to Atlanta early in the morning. Uh, the pilots were engaged in trivial conversation about football and uh, what's going on in your family and how long you're going to be with, you know, all that kind of stuff. Not paying any attention to what runway they were on, not paying any attention to the lights on the runway. So they took off on an unlit runway that was too short. It wasn't supposed to be used. They crashed right off, right off of the short runway into a clump of trees. Uh, 49 of the 50 people were killed in the crash. 
the only person who survived was a co-pilot. Uh, so I was one of the lead counsel in that case and trial counsel. Uh, we settled all the cases at mediation, I think the Friday before the trial. And uh, after the case was over, you know how airplane cases are. A lot of lawyers come from all over. They're airplane, especially lawyers. And uh, they travel from state to state and town to town. And, and uh, sometimes they have connections with people, sometimes they don't. So uh, the local lawyers are kind of considered secondary, but we were all involved. And, and as it turned out, we had five people right here within uh, a block of where we live who had people involved in the crash or either killed or, or close family members. So we were really involved and we were involved in two of the cases uh, directly as, as uh, lead counsel. And I worked with uh, Bob Parks from Florida in one of the cases. So after the case was, were, cases were settled, uh, a lot, some of the lawyers from other states who are nationally known trial lawyers, railroad, I mean, aviation lawyers, uh, wanted to have press conferences where they wanted to talk about the, uh, what they had done and, and, uh, and the experts they used and and it was sort of a bragging type of thing that they wanted to do. So uh, I called a meeting of several of the local lawyers and, and included Bob Parks and several of the other lawyers and said, you know, we don't want to do this. You know, if it's not about you, it's not about the lawyers, it's about the people and their families. So we did something called Lessons of 5191, where we met with the families and we wrote with their help and with their uh, unanimous consent, pretty unanimous consent. One only didn't want to do a lesson. So we, we did it. And it was to the uh, NTSB, to the aviation, the FAA, to Delta, to Comair, uh, of what was wrong and how they should correct it. It went into some detail. We quoted with from these depositions, from the experts' testimony. And it was like it was written by the families. And uh, the newspapers, uh, were very complimentary and said that uh, uh, this was this was a really uh, classy way to do it. That the lawyers didn't uh, seek the publicity for themselves, and the families loved it. And all the trial lawyers that are on this call, including uh, Eric and Doug, I'm sure that in every case you you tell your clients that you know you not only made a difference for yourself and your family, but you made a great difference for a lot of people in the future so when we told the families that by doing this that they're going to that you know they're going to make a difference in the future and all of them in one way or another said well we can bring back our loved ones but we sure are proud of the fact that we can make it safer so uh that's one case uh another one was a uh case involving a u-haul tow dolly uh a pilot a jet blue pilot from uh who lived in indianapolis was driving his family through Kentucky with a tow dolly that he rented from U-Haul. And they had the tow dolly attached to the SUV, the Ford Explorer, and a passenger automobile behind the tow dolly. As they went through Elizabethtown, Kentucky on I-65, the tow dolly started shimmying and it's like the tail wagging the dog because the weight should have been in the front but with the tow dolly and the vehicle behind, there was more weight in the back. And it eventually, the thing went off the road and the passenger, uh, Corey Burke, uh, became, quadru became uh, para uh, paraplyzed, paralyzed. Uh, and we were in trial and the U-Haul uh, defense was that it was driver error, that he was unable to manage this thing. It was just a minor, uh, problem and he should have managed it and uh, they they did a reenactment of the entire incident they went to Indiana they went to Indianapolis they rented a tow dolly the same kind of tow dolly they had the same kind of vehicle they went through the scene and replicated the scene uh, almost exactly and uh, they had three experts from Los Angeles so it's like we're bringing Hollywood to Louisville Kentucky with all these uh, Hollywood experts, reconstruction and engineers, all these people. And uh, we'd been out there to, to depose them 
and, and, and taking the deposition, I noticed that they never produced a film of their reenactment. So I didn't ask them about it at the deposition, but it wasn't listed on the items that, that were in their file. So in the deposition, we just questioned them about their findings and their measurements and so forth. And then in the trial, I didn't ask any of the first two experts about the film. I asked the third one. And I said, now, you did a reenactment. You, you had all these experts. You went to Indianapolis. You rented vehicles. You went from there to Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Uh, and you had all these measurements and all these drawings that you got. Uh, now I want to see the films. He said, well, we didn't, we don't have, we don't have any films. I said, well, I mean, how's this jury going to really believe that you did this if you don't have any, you know, you went there with a camera, didn't you? I said, yes, we did. Well, what happened to the films? He said, well, we decided not to bring them. So that was my entire closing argument. You know, they just didn't want the jury to see the films, which would confirm what the driver of this Ford Explorer and three witnesses that saw him fighting the steering wheel had testified to. So that turned into the uh, Los Angeles Times had somebody covering the entire trial. They wrote a series on the U-Haul problems and their renting problems and this particular incident. Uh, and as it turned out, they knew from their testing that you had to have two times the weight of the vehicle in front to be able to use this tow dolly in the way that it was being used or else it would shimmy and shake and uh, the, uh, the, it would go out of control, the tail wagging the dog. And in the closing argument, I used the George Song song that I mentioned a little while ago. Uh, you know, that uh, they knew better and uh, they've known right and wrong and they decided, they knew from their own testing, they did it the wrong way. And in addition, if you got time, uh, I wanna share with, uh, with these great trial lawyers that are on the call, another little, uh, uh, I'll call it a, uh, strategy that I use, but it's a little book. Can you see it? It's called, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It's written by Robert Fulgham and uh, teachers, especially grade school teachers, they all know this book. And uh, those that don't know it, I'll read it. And I read it during the trial and I'll just read a little bit of it to, to you all. Uh, it tells about that uh, when I was in the kin in kindergarten, I'm playing in the sandbox and, and all that sand pile at Sunday school. And these are the things I learned. Share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them, clean up your own mess, don't take things that aren't yours, say you're sorry when you hurt someone, so, you know, you can't, you can't get any simpler than this, but you can't get any better. You know, jurors, they don't read advanced sheets. They don't go to uh, trial seminars. They don't know what intervening superseding cause is or uh, any of those things, but they know that right and wrong, and this says it as good as anything I could ever say. So I use that in the closing argument. And like I said, the case was very successful. And I think it's made a lot of difference because they've changed the way they rent uh, and, and uh, put these things on the road. Well, Eric, I see uh, Lloyd Nolan, he wrote in just now, great strategy, Peter. He liked that, Peter. And then thank you. it's lighting up, Harold Thompson. Hi all, thank you, Peter, for your leadership with ATLA and AAJ. Neil O'Donnell, who's one of only 129 lawyers who are certified trial lawyers in Pennsylvania. I just heard him speak a few days ago in San Diego. I know, I know him. Neil said, I, Peter, I still use many of your books and articles, including your annotated opening statements. Thank you for all you have done for this great profet profession and our injured uh, clients. Uh, Randy Kynard, who had written before, 
said, Pete, if you could only give one tip to a new plaintiff's trial lawyer about trial work, what would it be? And I would like to expand that to what are three pieces of advice you would give to a new trial lawyer? Randy Kennard is a great friend and a fantastic trial lawyer. Uh, if you haven't had him on a connectionology program, I'd suggest you do that. And the same with Neil O'Donnell. They're both great lawyers and great friends. Uh, uh, one tip, Randy, I mean, it's hard to do that. I've, I've got uh, many and, and uh, one would be, and I, I'm thinking of this a lot nowadays, uh, I'm not actually trying cases right now. Uh, I had many years ago, I had a detached retina from playing racquetball. Uh, I was playing with one of the UK football coaches and, and uh, he could really hit that ball and it hit the back wall and ricocheted and it hit my eye socket. And I had a partially detached retina. So uh, that day I went to see a doctor and they took me to Cincinnati and they said we could operate uh, and I said, and they said, but it's a little risky. And I said, how risky? And they said, well, you could lose your sight. And I said, what's the chance of that? And they said about 2%. I didn't like that either. I didn't like 2%. So I said, well, I'm just gonna, gonna stay with, with this. What, what could happen? They said, well, somewhere down the road, he might have some problems with it. So right before the COVID came, I started having some uh, vision issues with uh, reading and concentration and and uh, a little bit of driving at night. And uh, so I'm not actually trying cases, but I'm doing a little of what I'm doing here now, uh, trying to make a difference. And if I had one tip to young trial lawyers, it would be that to, uh, to make a difference in that case that will affect not only this case, but all the future cases that may, may come along. And, uh, I try to think of every case as an opportunity to make a difference. Okay. And also, you know, if I could give two, uh, I've seen people through my career, and I'm, I'm sure you all have, where, uh, where you attend a lecture or, or all of a sudden you want to do like, like Doug or Eric or John Romano or Randy Kennard or something like that. Well, I think uh, Yogi Berra said it best. And I've got it written down here. Uh, exactly what he said. If you can't imitate someone, don't copy them. <laughs> which, which I think is about as good a way to, to say that uh, just be yourself, be genuine. If you got to use a shirt back to use it, go ahead and use it. If you stutter, go ahead and stutter. Uh, but just be yourself because it's, it's a message that you've got, not necessarily uh, how tall you are or how bright you are, or, uh, whether you got hair or not. And uh, I think everybody's got a chance to be a great trial lawyer. All right, Peter and Eric, it looks like Ginger uh, has a couple, couple people who are going to share some information with us. And there's Kyle uh, Kenberger with HMR. Kyle, I just saw you and... <laughs> San Diego at uh, TBI Med Legal, and you were very generous to work with the lawyers there. What tell us about HMR, and tell what do you think about this uh, webinar so far, Kyle? Man, it's been fantastic. I, I I love hearing the the tools for young lawyers and 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 kind of a take on on what somebody who's really you know been through it and who's seasoned you know would recommend. So it's been great. Um, Obviously, there's always a lot of great information that's shared here, so we appreciate it. Um, well, I, I, I think I think as a lot of you know, um, you know, when we're talking to to most lawyers around the country, a big part of what we do is is helping out on the catastrophic injury cases. Um, you know, in San Diego, uh, it was all about traumatic brain injuries and and and. Uh, concussion and that kind of stuff. And so obviously that's a huge part of what we do. A lot of the cases that we get involved in, Doug, are, are uh, people who just don't have the health insurance or the, or the resources to get the treatment they need while their case is going. And so 
uh, we step in as that resource to, to be able to provide funding for that treatment, uh, as well as connect people to a bunch of different things like um, maybe it's a life care planner or an accident reconstructionist or, you know, an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I, I think uh, on one of these programs, Joe Freed probably said it best. He said it's it's more than just funding. It's a, it's a resource to connect people across the country. Uh, and as we told you, you know, we do everything non-recourse, which means we look at these cases like lawyers do. Uh, we don't charge any interest or fees. And, and once we fund it, uh, we're truly partnering with the law firms. Um, and we do this across the country. Uh, but but this platform at Connectionology has really been a great thing for our company, and it's been a great way for us to meet trial lawyers. So uh, we really appreciate the opportunity, Doug. You're welcome. And Kyle, we'll have to you have to bring Peter down to New Orleans, where you uh, your <laughs> world headquarters is, and have but you got it. To, yeah, I, we'll have to talk think, to Peter about that. Well, I think I think Southern trial lawyers will hopefully be going in uh, in February. So hopefully that happens again. So. All right, uh, back to you, Ginger. Great, thank you so much, Kyle, for everything that you do. And I know Ted is gonna be jumping in a little bit later because he's gonna announce the winner of the coffee giveaway. Um, so be sure to add your information in the chat so everybody can stay in touch and reach out to you. Thanks you again, it. Kyle. Thanks, Ginger. And now um, we're gonna take another just quick break um, I want to introduce you guys to Leon Branham with Plaintiff Support. He's not able to be here with us today, so he's going to play this small video for you. And then we're going to jump back into more questions because there are still a lot of great things to ask Peter. And um, I can't wait to hear it too. So one second, and I am going to play this for you guys now. Hi Ginger. Hi Ginger, thanks, thanks for, for thanks, thanks to, you. to you. Thanks, thanks to you. all the moderators and to Connectionology for allowing plaintiff support to support the great work that uh, the folks at Connectionology do, the important work uh, to spread the education to fellow attorneys. Uh, my name is Leon Branham. I'm the Executive Vice President of Attorney Relations at Plaintiff Support. And Plaintiff Support really started this industry some 30 years ago. Uh, our founder, Joe Donaro, DiNardo, um, really kind of was the first funding company um, to help uh, plaintiffs uh, with advances against their cases. Uh, over the years, the last 29, nearly 30 years, we've funded over $2 billion uh, with our, within our family of companies uh, to over 20,000 satisfied customers and attorneys. Uh, we're among the lowest rate in the industry and we're committed to responsible funding. You're not gonna see us on television, billboards, TV ads, selling money to your plaintiffs. We only work with attorneys to help support uh, your clients uh, with an advance to help them during the litigation uh, period. Uh, we're a founding member of the uh, American Legal Finance Association and we're exclusively endorsed by the National Trial Lawyers. So it's like a financial David versus Goliath uh, with the plaintiff attorney having to cover their own expenses on every case upfront and on a contingent basis. Meanwhile, the defense has their fees and their expenses covered by deep pocketed insurance companies. So naturally, this creates a culture where the defense delays case resolution and will attempt to outspend you as a tactic for your client to accept less than what their case is worth. So we've de uh, developed financial solutions for every part of your practice to counteract that and to level the playing field. Uh, starting with pre-settlement non-recourse funding for plaintiffs uh, so your client can cover their expenses without financial pressure uh, and uh, is able to um, uh, withstand the litigation period and uh, avoid accepting a lowball offer by the defense. Uh, we offer post-settlement funding for plaintiffs and attorneys to, uh, for you and your client to access your settlement funds now while liens and other issues are getting resolved. We offer case cost funding for experts. Uh, this allows you to work up more of your cases now to prove your damages and liability, set the right tone with the defense that you're not looking for a quick and easy, cheap settlement. 
Uh, and what this will do is increase the value of your case with the right expert and decrease the time it takes in litigation. Uh, further, we provide medical funding for your uninsured and underinsured clients uh, throughout the country or nationwide. Uh, so funding for medical care, uh, whether it's local or out of state, if you need a recommendation or need, uh, you don't know anyone and your client is out in the area, we work with providers all over the country. Uh, and we fund everything from pain management to spinal surgery to TBI imaging and rehab, you name it. And then finally, we provide law firm lending, right? Funding for your overhead in running the practice, whether it's funding for marketing uh, and, uh, or advertising or case acquisition, uh, whatever non-case related expenses. So uh, we look forward to working with you. Uh, here's my contact information. Um, Ginger will also put it in the chat afterwards. Uh, we thank you for your time and look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thank you again so much to Leon. I will be making sure that everybody gets the contact information for all of our speakers and partners today. Um, but now let's get back to it because we have a lot to cover um, in a short amount of time. Eric, I'm gonna hand it back to you. That was good. All right, thanks, Ginger, and thanks again to our sponsors. Uh, so, Peter, I want to maybe switch gears a little bit. We've been talking about uh, some of the the great successes and achievements, but uh, you know, in the law, like in life and and in sports, some of our greatest lessons come from our losses. Uh, and I know this is always a tough thing to ask a trial lawyer uh, because we try to move past those and, and put them out of our mind as quickly as possible, but. What, what are some of the lessons you've learned along the way, either from your losses or from mistakes you've made uh, that may, where maybe you can help the rest of us uh, avoid repeating them? Eric, uh, I thought y'all maybe had 15 more minutes to finish and it would, it would take me hours to cover all of my mistakes and losses. So uh, when I was a young lawyer, I'd had a, had a couple of cases that uh, didn't turn out as well as I'd like. And so they asked me to chair a seminar and I had one called Cases I've Lost and Why. And uh, we invited some fairly well-known lawyers then to come and speak. Uh, let, let, me, let me give a mistake uh, that, that I made that I've kind of tried to learn from, but... Uh, in my, I'm thinking about young lawyers and lessons to, to them, experiences maybe they won't have to uh, relive that, I, that I've lived through. But uh, we used to try soft tissue cases or neck and back sprains, uh, rear end collisions. And uh, I made the mistake in, in, in one of these early cases of kind of evaluating the case like the insurance adjusters do or the defense lawyers do. They would have a formula. They would say, well, okay, she's 33 years old. She's got a 5% impairment. She's got, so they would have, you know, you've, you've seen this, they would go through and the AMA had tables of impairment and they would look and they say, okay, I'll give you this much money. And so, you know, we'd either take it or we'd go to trial. If we went to trial and we got more money than what they'd offered, then we thought we were doing good. So one time I, I went to trial on one of these cases and, and we got a, a nice verdict. And uh, we had like a lady with a 10% impairment and uh, we got a good verdict. And one of the jurors came over and said, uh, why did you only ask so much money? And I said, well, we thought that was reasonable for this case. And he said, uh, he was a baseball coach. And uh, this was in Richmond, Kentucky, and he was a baseball coach. And he said, well, he said, 10% impairment. He said, you know, if you're a baseball player and I've got a player that was a good pitcher and he had a, a ruptured uh, tendon in his shoulder and he still tries to pitch, but he's, you know, he may be 10% less, but he, we can't use him as a pitcher anymore. And if you'd have asked three times what you'd asked for, we would have given that to you. We all agreed to that in the jury room. So I'm thinking, man, here I've been congratulating myself on, on such a big verdict. And 
you know, we, we, we didn't even come close. We evaluate like they did, the insurance adjuster and the defense lawyer and their IME doctors. When they said 10% impairment, they said they act like that was nothing. Next case, wasn't in Madison County. The next case was in Clark County. Same defense lawyers. And in that case, we cross-examined the IME in a, uh, about the permanency rather than the impairment. And this one was only 5% impairment. And it was a man rather than a woman, but it was like 32 year old man and said, okay. And he only gave him 5%. And I said, 5%. Now that's 5% permanent, right? Yes. And that's every day and every hour. And it, it lasts forever, right? He said, well, permanent means forever. He's trying to be smart. And, you know, we, we stressed that in closing argument because they didn't come, but I had the, that section blown up. Yes, permanent means forever. And uh, so instead of the uh, argument that 5%, buying into the argument that 5 or 10%, not that big a deal, uh, I made this argument. You know, they say it's a small disability. Suppose you had a, you've heard this before because I've done it at seminars and and uh, Doug has, but let me give it again for those that haven't. Suppose you had a pebble in the shoe. It's a very small pebble, but every time you take a step, you know that pebble's in your shoe. Suppose you had a beautiful painting and some janitor uh, carelessly brushed up against it when he's cleaning up the room. He doesn't, he doesn't mess up much of it, but he, he, there's a little scar on the corner of that painting not even 5%. Now that painting is destroyed. Suppose that, you know, it's your wife or your date or your girlfriend wearing a dress to a fancy dinner and uh, somebody carelessly uh, smokes a cigarette and, and burns a hole in that dress. They're not going to want to wear the dress. And here we're in racehorse country. Uh, suppose you got a racehorse. He's working out on the track, Churchill Downs or Keeneland. He's working out on the track and he hits a rock or something out on the track and he's got a chip in his heel. Not a big chip, but he can't run. He runs like 5% slower than he used to. He's not gonna be able to race like he did in the big races or any races. Uh, suppose you got a clock. It doesn't lose much time, but it loses five minutes every hour. Suppose you got a boat and you lo love to take your boat out. And somehow you get a hole in that boat. It's only a small hole, but you can't ever get it out. Uh, that was, you know, in the days of the Challenger, suppose you had a leak in a rubber seal of a booster rocket. Uh, suppose you had a small loss of speed. I use the athlete. Suppose you had a small loss of speed by a pitcher in a baseball game. So all these examples and the jury, I mean, this was there. This is everyday life. And uh, they came in with a verdict three times as much as the one for the 10% impairment. This was one for 5% impairment. And I did this for the rest of my life as long as I was trying those kind of cases. So, uh, you know, that was a mistake uh, that I made in, in not doing it. And, and I hope that uh, it's helpful to others to learn from that. That is super helpful. Uh, Ginger, we have time to go with another question or two. Yeah, we sure do. All right. He asked me, he asked me a little while ago if I can go back to one, Ginger. Uh, asked me about a trade or a, or a piece of advice. I think Randy Kennard asked, and I answered that. I, I want to give another one if I can. Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah, because okay. one of the questions I thought was really good was some of the um, advice that you would give a lot of the young trial lawyers who are starting out. So please share that. Okay. Peter, uh, Peter, we're going to give you, we're in overtime. We're going to go into extra time. So you've extra got the time you need. Okay. This is going to be short, but I did want to, you know, you've got uh, great people and nice people that have given their time uh, to do this. And, and if I can give one more piece of advice that would help them, uh, I'd be honored to do it. But I was trying a case involving the mayor of Louisville. Uh, one time, and as it turned out, uh, my wife, Lana, was the best friend of the mayor's wife growing up in Springfield, Kentucky. 
So he got injured in a in a car wreck while he was a mayor. And uh, the Louisville Courier Journal, this was a uh, fellow driving one of these speedy transport vehicles. And he was going so fast that he lost control on an icy road, crossed the median and hit the mayor on the opposite side of the road. So the mayor wound up in the hospital with emergency room and, and uh, he wasn't paralyzed or anything, but he had, he had an injury and he needed to be compensated. So the owner of this uh, transport company, he went on TV every night saying that this greedy mayor and his greedy lawyer are trying to put my little company out of business. And so when I started the trial, uh, the jury was kind of predisposed in his favor. And I asked the jury now, y'all have heard a lot from this uh, fellow that's been on TV and all. And I said, how many of y'all think that the mayor shouldn't be trying his case today? And the newspaper said 85%, but in the jury, three fourths of the hands went up. They didn't think we should be trying the case. So we went on and picked a jury and in uh, examining the jurors, uh, many of them said that they'd read the publicity, but they would, the judge would say, well, would you disregard what you've read and render a fair verdict? You, you know, you won't let that affect your judgment, right? And they would all say, no, I'd do the best I could. So he left all these people on the jury that, that I knew would be unfavorable to me. So then the defense lawyer was asking him, and he said, now, how many people here know the mayor, David Armstrong? And this lady, her name is Mrs. Thompson. She said, I, I know him. Well, how well do you know him? Well, I don't know him real well, but when he was running for office, one of our friends had a coffee in our neighborhood and he came and he was so nice. And I think he's an honest person and I think he would be very fair. And the lawyer said, well, would you be able to set that aside? And she said, yes, I would. And the judge says, well, you know, like, like we did with your people, I'm not going to strike this lady because she said she could set it aside. So I'm thinking, why don't we excuse her? So I said, judge, Ms. Thompson said she could set it aside, but we all want a level playing field. And although she would try to do the best she could, I think it'd be hard for her to set this aside since she's had this experience and I wouldn't want to put it through it. So Mrs. Thompson, I'm going to ask the court to excuse you. So how could they object now? Both of us are asking to have her excused. And now all these other people that had said that they could set it aside, they started volunteering. They said, well, you know, I, I feel like Mrs. Thompson, except we're on the other side, but it wouldn't be fair. So now we get all these people. So we sacrificed one potential juror to get at least 15 struck that would have been on our jury had we not done that. So, you know, sometimes you think you're, you're fighting the battle and you're, you're going to do everything you can to strike these jurors, but uh, you're likely not going to lose them. So why don't we level the playing field and get all of them off? And that was one way to do it. And it just happened because uh, it came up in this trial. So I wanted to mention that experience. Well, Peter, I heard this weekend at the conference I was at that Lisa Blue asked the tells the jurors, it is just as patriotic for you to tell us that you cannot serve on a jury as it would be to say you can serve on a jury. And that's, uh, what do you think of that? That's exactly right. And that's a great way to do it. And she does a terrific job. That, that's beautiful. Eric, let me ask you, we, those of us who love the law and trying cases, you know, Peter Perlman, we can learn so much from him and we have limited time today, but I did notice he had, he had his, uh, you know, his uh, dry cleaning thing there and looked like it was color coded and all that. Are there any things on your, on your, uh, your, your sheet there that you might want to share with us? And two, do you color code things in, in trial? Now I've got two, two kinds of pens that I use. One is black and one is red. Okay. And that's about as far as I go with, with my shirt backs. There, there is one thing you, 
you, you all kind of told me in advance that you'd cover certain areas. Uh, he asked me about what movies I like that might impact on the law. Can I touch on that a minute? You have the floor. Of course. Um, there are two that I think are really, really great and that uh, are uh, great for us to be used in court. One is To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, which is great, not only about the uh, prejudice and all that, but the uh, the way that uh, Gregory Peck played the role. And then we saw the play in New York, and Jeff Daniels did a terrific job on that. And for the life of me, I can't do any better in a trial than, than what the verdict has taught. The, did you see the movie, The Verdict, uh, yes. Doug and Eric? Yes. Uh, it's old. As it turns out, I knew the guy that wrote the book, Barry Reed. And uh, I don't do, I haven't done medical malpractice for many years. I did one early on and uh, it was a case that nobody would take uh, because of the, it was in Frankfort, Kentucky and it was the only hospital in Frankfort, Kentucky and nobody wanted to take on the only hospital in, in that community. And finally they came to me and uh, I had, uh, heard about Barry Reed and his case involving a small child. And I called him up and I said, I got this case. Can you tell me who I can talk to? He said, well, there's an expert over here at Harvard that wrote the book on, on decelerations and, and all kinds of things. You might talk to him. So I called him up and I talked to his secretary and she said, well, the doctor's not in today, but, and I said, well, you think he'd be willing to talk to me? Is he going to be in tomorrow? And she said, yeah, he's going to be in tomorrow. Are you going to be in Boston? I said, yeah, I'm going to be in Boston. <laughs> I wasn't going to be in Boston, but I got a flight and I went to Boston and I got his secretary's name. I think it was Ethel. And I said, Ethel, I'm the guy that called you yesterday. She said, well, the doctor stepped out, but can you leave your, your papers here? And I said, okay. She said, he won't testify. I know that because he's refused to do that in a lot of cases. I said, that's okay. I just want to talk to him. So I go and walk through the the park it's across from the parker house and and i come back about an hour and a half and and i hadn't even met him yet he comes out and he says he says i don't use the testify but i will testify and what they did here the doctors were were asleep in the in the doctor's lounge while this lady had late decelerations warning of of serious potential damage and this child was born with brain damage cerebral cerebral palsy and He's a lifelong friend of ours to this day. So the case really had a lot of meaning. And the movie, The Verdict, uh, comes into play because Barry Reed wrote it. And Frank Galvin is played by uh, Paul Newman. And in the movie, the hospital altered records. In ours, we had some alterations of records, not as big as they did in the movie, The Verdict. But the one thing that the one takeaway from that for young lawyers and, and you know other lawyers is uh, the closing argument that Paul Newman gives as Frank Galvin, uh, where he says, you know, we have the law, we have books, we have statutes, and we have statues, we have uh, monuments in, in uh, the Washington and in our cities and great monuments, and we have the Bill of Rights. He said, but these are all just symbols of the law. Uh, what we have, the way the law operates is what you're doing in this jury box today, because you are the law. And all these other things, all these symbols, they would absolutely mean nothing if it wasn't for you being the law. And I thought that was that was what won the case for him. And uh, if you haven't seen the movie, uh, I would. I would really urge you to do that because it's as good as any, it's, it's been played a big role in my life and uh, Barry Reed became a good friend of mine. So I'm kind of partial to that, but I think it's a great learning lesson. Uh, there is a comment from a man named John Romano, Peter. And he <laughs> he's, writes, a, he's a legend himself. He's a hall of famer. Like you are it says oh, Peter. Man. Peter is a hero to us. Great leader. Fabulous mentor, extraordinary advocate, the ultimate human being, a man of genuine warmth and kindness. I oh, say amen. You, I say amen to that. John is right there with Joe DiMaggio in the Hall of Fame. I'll tell you. <laughs>
<laughs> what do you say, Eric? You want a, uh, any uh, closing comments? Because you opened us today. I turn it over to you. And I want to tell you, Peter, in a very difficult environment in the state of Florida, we truly have had a champion in Eric Romano. And of course, his brother, Todd Romano, great trial lawyer in his own right. And of course, John Romano. But Eric, under some of the most trying circumstances like you've had over the years with the legislature, he protected injured people in the legislature. And we really appreciate that. So. Yeah, I keep up with John and Todd and the whole family, Nancy. And I still get the uh, Florida Academy of Florida Trial Lawyer Journal every month. And I read it. And, and congratulations to, to you all on doing so great. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Doug, for your very kind words. But Peter, uh, look, I, I have always looked up to you. I think you know this. I, I uh, first met you when I was a uh, really a child going to oh, AJ yeah. and other trial lawyer conventions with my dad. And sometimes he'd let me tag along, sit in the back of the room and say, look, here's the great Peter Perlman speaking. And uh, I, I have fond memories of hearing you speak uh, as I grew up. And then uh, when I went on to law school, became an attorney, had an opportunity to, to really get to know you as a lawyer. Uh, I've heard you speak many times, uh, have read your, your writings. Uh, you have taught me and, and our fellow lawyers so much about not only how to be a great trial lawyer, great advocate for our clients, but really about what it means to be a, a true, decent human being who, as you said earlier, strives in every case to make life a little bit better for the clients we represent. Uh, you epitomize that. And it truly is an honor for me to be a part of this today, to be able to spend some time with you. You've been very generous with your time, not just today, but anytime you have the opportunity to share uh, your insight and experience with others. Uh, we're so grateful to you for doing it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eric. And you all have been terrific and I've enjoyed it. All right, you guys, um, Peter, I'm going to go back to you in a minute because I wanted to ask you if there's any last um, things that you'd like to cover or share with everybody. But before I do that, I'm going to give you a minute. I want to bring in Ted Mollis from HMR because he's going to announce the winner of the four bags of freshly roasted Ethiopia coffee. So somebody on this webinar is going to win. And don't worry, if you don't win today, you still got a chance. We have another wonderful webinar tomorrow at three o'clock Eastern time. Um, I do wanna thank again, all of our partners for being so supportive of our webinars because they make it possible for us to do these. And I cannot wait until next year, 2022, because we're gonna be rolling out um, seven to eight different um, cities where we're gonna be doing live seminars. And I hope that everybody will come out there and spend time with us because as P Peter was mentioning, you know, it's really important to you know, be involved, come out there and, and spend time with your colleagues and get educated. Um, I've got hey, for, sorry, Ted coming for in right some, now. For some reason my video won't start, but I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we sure can. Thank you for being with us today, Ted. Um, weirdest thing, I'm not sure what's going on. I'm, I'm very sorry. It's okay. Um, well, we're excited. We'd love to know who is the winner of today's special HMR coffee giveaway. Yeah, I'm excited to announce that it's uh, Randy Kennard out of Nashville, Tennessee, and it was neat that uh, he got uh, mentioned during the uh, presentation as well. So congratulations. Fantastic. Way to go, actually, Randy. Yeah, Randy's a great trialer of Tennessee. Oh, he was yeah. actually one of my members back when I worked for AAJ. Um, they do such good, great, great work out there. So congratulations to you, Randy. Um, both myself and Ted are going to reach out to you after this webinar, and uh, we hope you enjoy the coffee. And now um, I am going to share my screen real quick because I do want you guys to um, see that I'm going to be emailing this to you in a few minutes so you can reach out to Peter, stay in touch with him. He is so accessible and so, again, generous with his time. And please stay in touch with Eric and Doug and all of our incredible uh, partners. So, again, I'll email this to everybody. But in case you'd like to take a picture, you can do that right now. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to you, Peter, so you can do the closing comments for today. Again, we are so honored to have you. Um, this has been really amazing. Thank you, Ginger. 
Uh, I appreciate uh, the, the kind words and, and, and congratulations on the good work you're doing to bring this uh, type of program to people uh, around the country. I think it's terrific. Uh, in kind of finishing, uh, we're getting ready to play a big football game. My team, the University of Kentucky Wildcats, they play the Florida Gators, which uh, a lot of the people that are listening are from Florida and they're following the Florida Gators. So we're a big underdog. Uh, many years ago, we had a coach in Kentucky. His name was Bear Bryant. And uh, we taught him how to coach in Kentucky. And then he wound up at Alabama and he became the probably the greatest coach of all time. So I'm going to close with, with uh, what he said one time at a football game at halftime. Alabama was playing Auburn, and Alabama was like unbeaten. They were 9-0, and oh, and Auburn was like 5-4 and four going into the 10th game. And if Alabama won, they were going to be national champions. If Auburn won, all they had the bragging rights that they beat Alabama. So at halftime, Auburn's ahead 13 to nothing. And the Bear and his Alabama team are in the locker room. And uh, he doesn't say anything. He's sitting in his little chair. He's got his head down. He had this checkered hat on, which he always wore. And the official comes in and says, Coach, it's time to get back out on the field. And all the players get up. And he's still sitting down with his head down, not saying anything. And finally he starts talking. He said, now, boys, I don't want you to think that beating Auburn today is a matter of life and death. It's more important than that. And with the challenges that we face in our communities, the political divide and the, and the battles that, uh, that we have and we will have in the future, uh, the rule of law is critical to the uh, function of our democracy. And who, who is better to be sure that uh, we continue to live in a country where the rule of law is but us, the trial lawyers? So it's really more important than life and death. And I'll close with that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter. And again, thank you for being here with us today. We're gonna remember this for many, many, many years to come. And uh, we hope to see you out at one of our live seminars with us again next year, okay? Okay. All right, everybody, Eric, thank you. Thank you, Doug. And thank you to everybody watching. We hope we see you again soon. And um, go seek justice, right, Doug? Seek justice. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoyed it, thanks. <laughs> Bye, Peter. Bye-bye.